Welcome on this uh, beautiful sunny, sunny March day. Um, it's great to see you all here as always. Welcome to, uh, I guess, our penultimate lunch poems of the year. And it's a special one. We have Esther Berlin with us um, in from Colorado. And I wanna first start by thanking all the people uh, that make lunch pumps possible. It's really, really a community effort. Um, first and foremost, the library, as represented by Amber and the student workers uh, that help us out every time. The dean's office helps us fund uh, the magic we do, and as does the English department. And the Arts Research Center is um, have been such amazing allies um, as we try and make lunch pumps possible. Um, they're forceful advocates for poetry uh, and all the arts here at Berkeley. So thank you to the Arts Research Center. They're also, they will also be sponsoring the craft talk that Esther will be giving um, a little later in the afternoon. Before we start, if you could silence your phones um, and without further ado, our director, Jeffrey G. O'Brien. Thank you. Thank you, Noah, and thank you, Esther, for being here. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, Esther's most recent volume of cartography, which will hopefully help us hear in real time whatever work Esther presents. Um, the of in of cartography identifies map making as a thing that the volume will consider, but it's also a, the genitive indicating origin, an implied being that in this case comes from maps being of cartography that is bound by and to them, to how land is divided into holdings and possessions, which then enclose people in arbitrary, abstracted, but all too real space. Quote, a house made of mirage, as one poem puts it, or as another has it, a place some call California, a place of mirage and machines. If treaties, legislation, and policy, like maps, can turn land into fateful words. In Boleyn's work, we sometimes see words become picture and place. In the poem, before we ever begin, the poem's second page makes a mountain range out of virgules, that slash used to indicate a line break, and um, out of periods, which look like mega ellipses of the unsaid or unsayable. This is not a mirage and doesn't intend to deceive. It is a site that may not quite be materially habitable, but it does express a different relationship between word and space, between the poetic sign and belonging, where possession is zero tenths of the non-law. This distinction between what a state does to the land it occupies and how native peoples think and feel the land keeps coming up in language whoever's, and in this book's verse. In the poem called The Birthed and the Birthing Years, relocation is paraphrased as, quote, a governmental tangram. State power is an arrangement of geometric puzzle pieces. But those puzzle pieces are not static cartographic image or mirage. They can be reconfigured into other temporary forms, other maps and non-maps. And that is one of the works of poetry and of this poetry, to show how else it has been and could be by taking the parceled out state of the land with its history of dispossession and relocation and all the euphemistic acts of language that have attended that history and turning that language, all language, both English and Navajo, into a counter relation, quote, delicate flowers emerging from cement cracks the temporary fragile thing that keeps eluding total domination and obscurity. Of cartography is divided into four sections that index the four cardinal points of the Diné, east, south, west, north. They might appear out of order to European eyes because they mark the movement of the sun across the sky. East is dawn, south is day, west evening, and north the night. This alternative ordering shows how contingent and how meaningful ordering is and how many orders lie latent or ignored within the dominant. Place and direction here are temporal. Maps are both fake and real, imagined and materially determining. 
Late in the book, Boleyn confesses, quote, my real map marks the births of my four children. That's a map approaching actual habitability. Until then, we have this urgent, insurgent verse that relocates relocation and ofs of. Please join me in welcoming Esther Boleyn. Thank you for um, that great reading of the work and noting those um, ideas of mirage because that will um, be a topic that I'm going to be um, kind of digging deeper into later this afternoon. So, yat e shik e do shidene Esther Belen Yenishia, Kloge dene Nishle, Twitter Chitney Bashes Ching, Kitla Chitney Dashate, Todd Chitney Dashanella, Akotego denen Astan Nishle. So I, I introduced myself um, in the Navajo language and, uh, you know, with all um, this new, newer um, acknowledgement of land, um, you know, just I was really lucky to be at a conference a few weeks ago with um, Beth and uh, other indigenous scholars and um, and, it's, and that's a really good time for us when we gather. And, you know, we were talking about the Navajo introduction. And, and it really is a land acknowledgement um, because it, it really does place us not only in, in within the land, but within the landscape of um, relationship and people. And, and so I'm, and then to be in a library, which is really special also, I think, for writers. Um, and then also to have that uh, really emphasized to be back on the Berkeley campus. I was an undergraduate here um, in the mid 80s. And, and it, you know, this is where um, I definitely left and grew a lot of roots here. And, and so special time. So thank you for joining me here today. Thank you for all the folks who organized this. Um, so I'm gonna start with this um, brief opening and this is uh, for all the indigenous people in the room. We were scattered on purpose. Then we scattered for survival, jagged, Choking thunder strikes, sections my limbs to nubs. Our creator's handicraft sectioned into scattered bloodlines, wandering surface in search of the source, contributing to the manufacturing of commercial commodification. The voidless vessels assemble the line of action figures and baby dolls compress our compressed salt, sold by the pound, eventually cataloged and shelved, compressed, sold by the pound. We are re-territorializing our public spaces, reclaiming the direction of our scattering, instilling vapor into the soil of our land, the recollected wind in our songs. And I'm going to start reading from my uh, first collection, From the Belly of My Beauty. The beckon for liberation itches on my back. I scratch desert-dried arroyos littered with fading Budweiser cans and roadside crosses dangling plastic flowers. I stumble from the grotesque reflection recycled. I stumble with my commod-filled body running a Reedy's race. I stumble at my shadow raised by Los Angeles skyscrapers. My expression is a liberation functioning as a contrived reality boxed into Indian, identifying the branches of soul wounds into another contrived reality called American, also known as the United States, in power until we salt our tongues, bridging callous shoulders, a great wall of burnt flesh. 
ideographs, tongues swollen from word arrows, our stories etched on our backs, and reading our backs does not start the healing process. To be cleansed with winds from Canyon de Chez, luster of precious stones, hundreds of years smooth. Um, when I was an undergraduate here, the um, Intertribal Friendship House in Oakland was um, a, a safe spot for um, a lot of us students here, and I know that that place has seen better, better times, and they used to host every Wednesday um, a dinner, a community dinner, and and a group of us students would would ride BART and go down there and and eat with the community. Bluesing on the brown vibe, one. And coyote struts down East 14th, feeling good, looking good, feeling the brown, melting into the brown that loiters Rapping with the brown in front of the Native American Health Center, talking that talk of relocation from tribal nation, of recent immigration to the place some call the United States, home to many dislocated, funky brown. An ironic immigration, more accurate, tribal nation to tribal nation, and coyote sprinkles corn pollen in the four directions to thank the tribal people indigenous to what some call the state of California, the city of Oakland, for allowing use of their land. Two, and coyote travels by greyhound from Albuquerque, New Mexico, USA, through Denetra to Oakland, California, USA, laughing. Interstate 40 is cluttered with RVs as far away as Maine, traveling and traveling to perpetuate the myth. Coyote kicks back for most of the ride, amused by the constant herd of tourists, amazed by the mythic Indian they create. At a pit stop in Winslow, Coyote trades a worn beaded cigarette lighter for roasted corn from a middle-aged Navajo woman squatting in front of a store, and Coyote squats alongside the woman, talking that talk of border town blues, of reservation discrimination, and bluesing on the brown vibe, a Biligana snaps a photo, and the Navajo woman stands silent, holding out her hand, requesting some of her soul back. Instead, she replaces it with a worn picture of George Washington on a dollar bill, and Coyote starts on another ear of corn, climbing onto the greyhound, the woman still squatting, waiting, tired of learning not to want, waits there for the return of all her pieces. Three and Coyote wanders right into a punka, sitting at the Fruitvale BART station. Next to the punka is a Seminole, and Coyote struts up to the two. Where are y'all from? The punka replies, Oklahoma. Pause. The Seminole silent watches a rush of people climb in and out of the train headed for Fremont, the Seminole stretches his arms up and back, stiff from the wooden benches. Pause. He pushes his lips out toward the punka, slowly gesturing that he too is from Oklahoma. Coyote wanders. Whereabouts? The punka replies, Punka City? Pause. The Seminole replies, Seminole? Coyote gestures to the punka. You punka? <laughs> the punka nods his head in affirmation, and Coyote nods his head in content. To the Seminole, 
He asks, you Seminole? Pause. The Seminole, now watching some kids eating frozen fruit bars, nods his head slowly. And Coyote shares his smokes with the two. And 10 minutes later, they traveled together on the Richmond train headed for Wednesday night dinner at the Intertribal Friendship House. Four. And Coyote continues to blues on the urban brown funk vibe, wandering in and out of existence, tasty, tasting the brown, rusty at times, worn bitter from relocation. And um, even I think in this first book, I was really uh, looking at land as, as form and, and memory and a source. And I, I think, you know, because I grew up in the LA area, and um, which is very different than the Navajo Reservation. Um, this poem is, is about that, directional memory. West, let's begin with the first thing you remember. You lost a sandal in the move from the apartment on Mulford to the house on Poplar Drive. Specific memory of wanting to go back and get the shoe. And in your head, you even telepathically announce it to everyone that you left your shoe at that old home, never to be seen again. Part of you left behind, never to be seen again. North. Kissing me with your red lips, blessing me with your divaness, shiny black hair, dancing at Mr. Five's nightclub, swinging wet with heat, steam from the jungle you emerged, traces my image in blues ultra. Our touch moved people off the dance floor and out of recliners. Our touch tack sharp tickled memories of Maxine Hong Kingston and Norman Mailer and Gary Snyder trying to levitate the Pentagon, of small children selling chiclets trying to levitate their image to heaven, our touch tender as ginger on tongue forks into the two of us. South, Christmas night in Southern California, rollerblading on the strand, night fishing off Hermosa Pier, walking on the beach, wanting to sleep there, not wanting to waken in someone's private property, saying it's a drag, yeah. Wanting to get a piece, saying it's a drag, because the sand belongs to the $6 million home in the background. When you were little, you called, the water called your name to jump in, same as the stench of contamination warns you to stay out. If all the sand in my boots could build my castle. East. When the awe of downtown Los Angeles scratches my back, the ghosts of native brothers and sisters of this tropical climate seers Great school, high school, never told of their existence. Indian land was far away. In another world, across state lines, where grandparents plant corn and herd sheep on a brown-eyed, blue-eyed horse. I always forget LA has sacred mountains. And I want to read another a little bit of this first book. Hmm. Yeah. Um, the amusement of the reservation never wore off because there was always good fun. <laughs> Herding sheep, jumping arroyos, riding horses, BB gun tag, card games, 
I never realized those times in my life could end, would end. Returning to California from the res, I always felt different. A sort of transformation occurred, like visiting a mystery land, spacious, no boundaries. I was free to roam, unlimited, freed from streetlights, cars, territorial gang warfare. The only limitation was the land. And somehow I seemed to break all her rules. I was constantly told not to touch this or capture that creature. I was unaccustomed to the mutual respect between people, the land, animals, but I soon learned the two worlds often clashed in me, creating blackness, a voice yearning to shout with boldness the way my aunt uses the Navajo language to get after me or tell a joke about me. Um, and I'm gonna expand on that idea of that transcendence and that idea of borders um, later today, but that was from, there was a, an essay in the back of, of that first book. So I'm gonna read from, of cartography. And um, in the introduction, there's before um, the directional kind of sections, there's this, um, and I call it kind of a precognitive um, state or, uh, of, of um, say, sounds and sayings and events, and that's um, from this. So there's like construction and building. Um, and the book really is kind of a vertical book. So this is sort of like an underworld type precognitive um, uh, space. Thinning into female mist. The spiral from my skull is tangled in the moon's belly, a zigzag attachment, a breathing entity, coal-fired thoughts, deepening, widening. Another moon approaches, like buffalo grass seed germination, thwarted, intact under layers, like what people say about Navajo culture, Primitive, chants, like a 12-step ladder. One, lightness. Navajos are much more than prayer. Cut the tops off the letters of my words. Two, air, spaces, people fighting us, prayer, full, of, I use Wi-Fi to connect, and three, dry land and separation. Arroyos in more than the spirit world methodology. I cut a window into the walls with my prayers. The flood spills across the page. Look, silver screens groom the sky. Their constant filtering brings frost. The iridescent paint Coyote uses over the low mountain, under the low moon, a firmament. Look, this is where mom hid the metal tin containing all of her stick toys. The flat sandstone slivers, begun, still stands. Look, this is what they call Navajo education. A speaker stand and a microphone hallowed out the air like cracking a can of pop. The first gulp of Navajos rotate like warehoused collections flattened on a screen, breathing in and in and never out. Distortion propelled as Promethean and people sit quietly in awe of the striptease, the digital transfers deluge the darkness, a marked deck of images displayed, and people sit quietly, stirred slightly from the stripper's blank stare, 
and they vaguely remember clapping their hands. Visibility, not subjective speculation, excavating the credible, sudden hovering, only the matrix, invisibility, not desexualization, structural opposition to savagism, the black printed text on paper. Milepost 54, Highway 491, Dirt Road 192, one and a quarter miles west. There you should find a house with a red metal roof. The house contains my Navajo education. Lesson 38. Not a bar, not a casino, not a hogan. It all began in a car. The kids are restless, tired of being confined to this holding tank. And this time it is cold. The dark cloudy mountains calculate early snow from the restless kids, tired of telling jokes, tired of playing I spy, tired of tribal radio. Assignment 38. Number one, diagram the separation. Two, write a poem about the language not spoken. Three, rearrange the lines in symbolic order. Yeah, so before, um, I was just thinking when I was reading that one about uh, the section So when I was here, I um, I had the, the great honor to study with uh, Maxine Hong Kingston, who was very influential in my um, my education, as well as Gerald Visner. And, and some of those um, poems allude to that experience and then kind of walking on campus of um, uh, seeing the, the Campanile and so during the time I was here, the Native American Graves and uh, Repatriation Act um, legislation was signed, and that was in um, 1990. And, and we had a lot of um, student discussion and community education and awareness around that. And, and I think, um, you know, at the, where I live now in, in Durango, Colorado, which is in the Four Corners region of the U.S., um, that, that bill is very much still, we're, we're, we're still in that process as a society um, trying to repatriate and, and return many items. And I know um, that Berkeley is, is part of that as well because they also had a huge collections and, and there were so many <laughs> rumors around where the remains were housed and um, a group of, of native students, I remember us like at night we would, and I don't know, we thought we were very um, clever or, <laughs> um, but we would go around campus and we would like smudge different buildings that we thought like had, you know, like remains there or that um, ghosts live there. And, um, and just because, you know, we needed that protection as students, right? That, um, that really affected, I think, many people. And, and we're seeing, and, and people talk about that as an illness um, and it just, kind of reminded me of that when I was reading those passages. Um, this one's called the albatross. Every day he walked into the albatross, sitting in a corner booth. He usually waited several minutes before ordering his first drink. The several minutes of decision-making always involved the first. A, time he was struck by lightning. B, bite of a North Beach pizza. Three, droplets of sweat mixing into a dance club's pheromones. D, 
a crisp October walk along the mesa's rim. Some days, the minutes turned into stories he used as reference points to bring him back to his quiet corner booth. His Aunt Lita told him once that he was abandoned because he was struck by lightning as an infant. That was the only time his heart skipped a beat. It felt like a kite, a strong desire to fly, not away or like a whirlwind. His desire was to spread across the planet with a force tumbling steady as a river. Some days he would replay the dialogue that never made it past his heart, like the time he just ate slice after slice of garlic pizza in a North Beach pizzeria. When he should have been using his mouth to ask Lindsay to be his wife, remember the day we met? I was still so an everything new, different. I never had until you, and I wanted never knew you the rest of my life. I didn't think you, I didn't think it much before I moved here and you. The wedding ring nestled in his pocket all night and on into the laundry day and on into the next laundry day until it was finally lost like all the one-sided socks that hung on the laundromat wall. Each month, the attendant displayed those lost socks into art, pinned and hung on the southernmost wall. He especially enjoyed the jack-o'-lantern in October. Some days he just sat quietly, soaking in the sweat moisture from DJ Kirk, threading the loop of everyone on the dance floor. It reminded him of the way his aunt patched his knee-torn jeans. Her crisscross stitches were always done with her gigantic spool of rainbow thread. The needle became a lightning bolt, weaving the rainbow's powers into his clothing. On the dance floor, the honey-scented steam fastened him to the circle. A venomous nectar entered his pores and incensed his morning coffee. Some days, the October chill frosted his words like an empty vending machine. Sometimes he would wait in the cold until he was restocked. He wasn't really sure where his words went, compacted into combustible carbonated units, or did his words spiral into thin coils of discs neatly bound like masking tape? The sun's rays said, my vibrations connect to your DNA. The Siberian elders chant in their cardboard, twangy, high-pitched whistle, singing in their special way, communicating with the spirits standing outside. The 61,000 indigenous horse people in Siberia are waiting for our answer. They are carrying an ornamental breastplate covering their exposed heart the yellow stars gather at the peak of a sacred mountain. The scientists are speaking in theoretical explanations. Your sickness is behind the wall. The ignored history is detailed in the Milky Way's placement. His whimpered question, learn the night chants. The enemy way is just a song? Colonization is just another mathematical theory trapped in the late harvesting of dried corn. And that dried corn simmers and stirs in a pot of winter stew months later, years later, or just minutes away. And I wanna read a few um, new pieces. Um, One for sure on, um, we were at a, the, the conference I had mentioned earlier and um, with the, I, it, it's, it's such a good feeling right now to have um, a growing body of Dene writers 
um, to really kind of develop each other and, and talk about our writing um, in a very uh, uh, relational way, right? I, I think we don't have to explain things to each other. We sort of just already know kind of what we're talking about. And um, so this is where, this is part of an epistolary um, poem series that I started with Jake Skeets and um, Lucy Tapahanso, who are both um, poets. <clears throat> Dear Jake, I have been thinking about the essay I'm writing. There has always been Navajo writers, but there has only recently been an interest in how they demonstrate literary sovereignty. I think people just have noticed that indigenous writers are indigenizing language indigenizing the landscape of the page, using the whiteness of the page, the silent burial of the indigenous soundscape. The revival is resuscitating. It rematriates erasure. The moment where indigenous takes ownership of that erasure, the violent history of smudging indigeneity off the page is reordered. Indigenous writers are rematriating the sounds, agency in the shaping of sound. Ha ha le, ha, ha i, ha a a. I have been stuck, or have I been stuck, in my own in invisibility, smudging sound as ash on my tongue. Dear Lucy, yesterday I became the unaspirated consonant, flattening myself into the page, depleting myself of air. I am lucky today the wind is blowing fricatives, several mile per hour, seven mile per hour gusts emerging from the Northeast. I keep thinking about Safia and her poetry, how she exposed her broken English, how her words break it open. I want to break letters, break the language until its rhyme, its heartbeat sinks with my unaspirations. She tells me, the landscape is begging me to find new language from it. When I think of her poetry, I want to build a fire. I want to gather wood, found dead wood from fallen trees that snap under slight pressure. I want to gather hardwood of the root wood to flame my fire. Dear Jake, of late, I have found myself staring deep into the whiteness of the page. I am snowblind. I am taken back to New Year's Eve, 1999. My family and I were on our way to a powwow. I was driving our minivan in a snowstorm from Durango to Albuquerque. I was driving and it was dark. I was by Cuba, rounding the bend. I was suspended. The snow-packed road widened. The wind blew powdery flakes across the road. I lost all sense of direction. I found myself staring deep into the whiteness, snow-blinded, inarticulate. So now I listen to the white spaces of the page. I listen for its breath. I tenderly move my fingers across the whiteness motioning the flattened spaces to awaken. The first to awaken is the diacritical glottal. What a funny word to represent the restriction of sound. An evocative hold of the throat, the sound of the suspended sound jets forward, sprays across the page, a silent roar chalking over a white volcanic ash landing of restricted sound. Dear Lucy, tonight I am writing a simple sentence in Dinepasad.
Sh'away yecha. I am home alone with no one to communicate with, no one who will ask. Nishant. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. That was really marvelous. Um, if you want more, Esther's book is being sold by Patrick from Pegasus Books back there, and I highly encourage you to pick it up. Esther will be signing books, um, so stick around for that. And stick around, too, for Esther's craft talk at 4 p.m., I believe, in Hearst Annex D23. Um, if you need instructions there, you can come up to me after um, or... Lori and Beth from Arts Research Center can also help uh, guide you. Our next lunch poems will be on April 4th, I believe, with Brandon Shimoda. Um, feel free to sign up for our mailing list on the way out, um, and you can review this reading as any past readings on YouTube. Thank you all for being with us today.